great to be here this morning and hopefully over the next you know 50 plus minutes i can give you some really interesting insights on drones public safety what have we achieved already and what challenges are still there and i can tell you this it is amazing to see the progress that we have made in this very young industry but it's also almost daunting to think about all the things that we still should and have to do in order for all of this to become even more impactful. But with that being said, technology is here. Technology has its place. Technology has its challenges. And it's up to us to really collaborate, figure it out, and make it happen. My career... Um, I started very differently. So I grew up here in Switzerland. Um, I had always wanted to work in space science. So I wanted to, you know, build rockets and potentially, you know, fly with them. But then I was diagnosed with uh, severe motion sickness and that didn't quite help me in my quest to become a Swiss astronaut. So I still moved to the United States because in Switzerland, you know, we do fantastic chocolates and amazing watches and we do some decent banking, but we don't do a lot of space exploration. And so I moved to California and I ended up spending almost 13 years working um, on various NASA space missions. And during that time, uh, exactly this summer, 10 years ago, I got exposed to the first consumer drones. And 10 years ago, those consumer drones were nothing than what we have today. And I remember the very first time I saw one of these drones on my best friend's coffee table. And I looked at it and I said, what the hell is this? And that started this journey of really trying to understand the technology. My friend at the time and still is um, doing forensic analysis. So they are recreating accident scenes from airplane crashes to vehicle crashes, train derailments, even murder cases. And in many of these instances, aerial imagery was needed to recreate the scenes of the accident. And there's a few options. You can either buy very expensive satellite imagery or you rent a helicopter, a fixed wing aircraft and you go and you get those images. And suddenly 10 years ago, we were able to put a GoPro camera on this device that we were able to maneuver in 3D space and get our images, get the images ourselves for barely no money. And that was kind of like the moment where I decided this technology will have an impact in public safety. And um, in my slides that I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk a little bit about that journey, what we learned along the way. And uh, if you have any questions, um, please maybe write them down or put them into the chat room. And then at the end, we can go over some of those. This is being recorded. So at any given point, people can go back and look at it. And you will also have my email address if you would like to ask questions or need further clarifications. Please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, just like Patrick, I truly believe in the open discussion and hear feedback, thoughts, ideas, because that's the one way we can really collaborate and improve upon what we already have. So I think that's a little bit of an intro. Shall I just dive into the slides? All right, let me do my screen share here. And then we, we will get this show off the ground, so to speak. All right, you should be seeing my cover page, public safety and emergency response. Um, here yeah. is my email address. Um, again, do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, I'm always trying to you know, get back to people. Uh, you can also find me on various social media outlets. Um, I'm quite, quite, quite um, yeah, interested in sharing um, information and anything that has to do with uh, collaboration. So we've talked about a lot of things already that I have in this slide, born in Switzerland, NASA 13 years, then I went over to DJI. 
I started at DJI um, at a very, very early stage, uh, 2014. And in 2014, public safety was not on the forefront. Uh, 2014 was the year where um, Patrick was working already on the code of conduct. And what are the things we have to keep in mind when deploying drones in humanitarian uh, on humanitarian missions? And a lot of that also applies to public safety. So it, it kind of started in 2014 with the thinking of uh, drones in public safety, but it, it took another year or two until we really started to get drones uh, into incidents and onto these you know, public safety events. I spent six years at DJI, and then just the end of last year, I made a move to um, a Swiss American company called Autarian. And that was because I wanted to get back to my vision piece. Um, at DJI, I was really able to establish that drones have a place in public safety uh, emergency response, as well as humanitarian missions. But there were certain things that I wanted to get done that are beyond that scope. And I wasn't able to do that at, at, at DJI. And so I moved to Atarian. And I will talk a little bit about what my vision is. So first of all, today, we're going to look at just a little bit at who is Atarian and what is our vision, because that plays into all of this. What are the challenges in public safety and what have we learned so far? We're going to look at um, the, the, the public safety drone landscape, and then we're going to deep dive into some of the public, case, public safety use cases. And um, I, I did kind of create a little bit of a logo for us here, and I used the Maltese cross, which is uh, often seen uh, when it comes to public safety because it's the symbol of protection. And... Um, as part of this protection, drones and software also play a big role. And so those are uh, embedded in those arms of the Maltese cross. Now, Autarian, the best way to explain Autarian is we are in essence the Android of the drone industry. The whole idea is that, um, you know, we have Apple that has a very closed system and you can only use an Apple phone with all the Apple you know, hardware and Android is an operating system that works on different manufacturers phones. So you can have a Samsung phone or you can have a Sony phone and your experience is the same. And the same applies to Atari and we are making not only the, the flight controller software that's based on an open source and open standard uh, with the PixHawk, um, but also we enable a variety of different manufacturers from aerial to ground technologies to be built into this ecosystem. And so suddenly we have one user interface, we have one way of interacting with these devices from multiple manufacturers. So it's a much more standardized approach. And to explain this vision is difficult, but Going back in time, there was a time when we said, well, why do I need a car? And then just uh, you know, a few decades later, it was like, why do I need a calculator? And just you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago even, why do I need a smartphone? In fact, yesterday I celebrated my 13th year on Twitter. And I remembered that I started Twitter when I still had one of those Nokia old phones and I graduated to a BlackBerry 13 years ago, thinking that is the most smartest phone there could ever be. And look what we're doing today. But why are we doing all of this? And that is really because we wanna bring the benefits of autonomous systems to the largest number of people across, to the workers in the field. We have really seen over the last few years that Drone technology is changing the way we do many jobs, many jobs that in include risky operations from inspection, going up on these cell towers to inspect something, to public safety, to many other um, job functions. Drones can really uh, make a big impact. We want to enable companies across. The goal is to create an ecosystem, a true ecosystem that is open and accessible, that brings choices to the people. And 
not only choices, but include communities worldwide. And that is something that Patrick and his team at, at, at We Robotics is really, really focusing on as well and have really set the groundwork that we can have these flying labs and not only go to these remote places potentially, but leave knowledge behind, leave technology behind, enable them to build themselves and become masters and experts themselves in their own areas. And that to me is, is a fantastic thing when we can see that a community in South America or in Africa is using drone technology that they built and coded. That's, that's an amazing feeling. So now, why are we doing all of this at Atarian? Why are we doing open standards and open source? Well, it's actually quite easy. It allows end users to have choices. So let's think of it of this way. The open source standards means we can have one interface, one user interface that works on multiple platforms from a ground rover to a multi-rotor to a fixed wing or a vertical takeoff and landing drone, all operate the same way with the same user face with potentially the same controller. And now that makes training so much simpler. Autonomy and AI, because we have on edge computing on the drone, on the flight controller, we can now run certain algorithms right on board and allow for autonomous navigation, communications with either mesh or 5G communication straight out of the flight controller. And then because again, it's open, it also allows payload camera manufacturers or sensor manufacturers to integrate into those different platforms very easily. And suddenly we have an amazing amount of choices available. And that is the exciting piece. Now in public safety, the challenges are plentiful and these are applicable to pretty much all of the different technologies that have come to market. We know that one size does not fit all. There is no one drone that can do it all. We have multiple sized platforms that are used for different types of missions. We have different payloads, different cameras, different sensors that are needed for different types of operations. Public, public safety has always a challenge with the environment because we need to do the search and rescue operation in rain, in high winds, potentially even in snow. It's not like we can say, well, you know what, let's wait until the weather is nicer and then we'll go fly drones. We've also learned that the drone operator is the data bottleneck. And I'm gonna go into that in a little, little bit later. An additional learning that we have is there is so much data that comes back from a drone or from any other camera and a high percentage of that data is not useful to us. I'll give you a good example. If we're doing a power line inspection and we're taking an image of this one resistor, there's so much information on that one image that's not helpful to us. Like all the background, all the sky potential in the background and all the other pieces that are in that image that are of no value to us because we're just looking for that one piece. So actionable data is the keyword. And then obviously in public safety, as you know, training is one of the key elements. Every single move has to feel second nature. And it's very difficult to train when there's no standard. When every drone or every different drone, even from the same manufacturer, operates differently, has a different interface, potentially a different app, the lack of standardization makes this more challenging. And this is nothing new. In 2016, I did a white paper project with Ina. Ina is the European Emergency Number Association. And maybe some of you are part of Ina. They're based out of Brussels. And we really did a, um, a study to see how would drones get integrated. And we had four different pilot test sites in areas such as Denmark, Wales, Ireland, and Iceland. So really challenging environments. And what we learned was, A, 
as I mentioned, the drone operator is today the bottleneck, especially in 2015, 2016. Lots of data comes in to be digested. We need actionable data to make better and faster decisions, and we need standardization. Five years ago, those were already identified as issues. And some of these we are still working on in, in, in order to get better results. So how have we gotten here? Well, this is a very, very rudimentary explanation of how it all started. In 2015, um, the idea was, okay, if we launch a drone and we have this aerial view of this structure fire, and we have the battalion commander, the incident commander, look over our shoulders, well, this is fantastic. The incident commander gets a perspective that he or she didn't have before. Well, what we didn't know was it became more of a distraction at the time. Interestingly enough, this is how most public safety entities still start a drone program today because it's simple, it's easy, it's the best way to get experiences. But what it really does is it distracts the battalion commander or the incident commander, it distracts the operator, and we had to get them away from this deployment methodology. So what came next? Well, we added HDMI out, meaning we now were able to put the live drone feed onto a monitor and we could separate the drone operator and visual observer from the incident commander. And that was a huge step because now you had a sterile cockpit environment where the operation of the drone was happening and you didn't have the incident commander over someone's shoulder. Now the incident commander would still be distracted at times because this new view of, of the incident from above was very distractive. All right, then we moved into live streaming. Suddenly, we had the ability to either use the smart device to look at the live video footage and stream that, or use third-party uh, solutions to stream that live view to maybe the fire department headquarters or to other areas not in close proximity. And that was already very, very helpful because we could get decisions, decision makers involved that were further away. And then a couple of years, three years ago, we started to see a very, very different concept, the drone as a first responder. For the very first time, we were not bringing the drone to the incident and launch it. We would launch the drone from the roof of the fire station or from the roof of the police station and fly from there straight to the area where the emergency call came from. Half of the time now, this drone arrives before any ground units get there. And that allows for us to already see what is happening and escalate or de-escalate at the incident site. But the way right now, because of regulatory environment and technology, um, it's still very cumbersome. So we have two people on the roof one an operator, one is a visual observer. We're running a cable into a control room. And that is still not where I envision technology to be in 2021. And this is where we're going. We're going into the area where the drone is in essence, an internet connected device, meaning we are live streaming from the drone through the network. And now we're not just sending data back to the fire department, but to anyone on route, um, maybe already there, that can access this and get, in essence, uh -oh. can anybody hear Romeo or is it just me? Right oh, away. And that off. data, am so I back? Yes, You're thank back. you, Romeo. All right. So let's see. I'm, I have been calling this the near death of the SD card. And if we rely on SD cards as our main data source, we have a challenge because these little cards 
are difficult to navigate. They're often difficult to get out of the aircraft. They're very manual intensive. And this cannot be our primary source of data. And so I call it the near death of the SD card. It can be your backup solution for the data, but it cannot be that you have to rely on an SD card to get your data into your own workflows. So let's take a quick look at public safety just in the US. Um, obviously, it's a little different here in, in Europe, but you get the idea. We have roughly 18,000 police agencies, about 30,000 fire departments. So we're roughly at about 48,000 departments in the US. Out of those 48,000, only 500 have access to a helicopter or fixed wing aircraft. That's a very, very low number compared to the many agencies there are. So obviously having the ability to launch a drone is tremendously helpful for a huge majority of the departments. The center of the study of the drone, um, they, that's part of the Bard College in the United States, they did exactly a year ago, their third edition of public safety and drones. And it has a lot of very, very fascinating information in it on how many departments are using drones, what type of drones they're using, and which states in the United States are the ones utilizing this technology most. And it's no surprise, it's California, Texas, Florida, the three states that are impacted by natural disasters the most. From hurricanes to earthquakes to fire, those three states are the ones that experiencing it all and therefore, they're also the ones that are using new technologies to help with those incidents. All right, so now let's, let's go into some of the use cases. And obviously, there are multiple reasons why drone technology is so helpful for public safety. First of all, getting this situational awareness is the key element, but it also allows us to make better and faster decisions, which then in return allows us to potentially save lives or mitigate risks, or then have a financial savings associated with them. So we, we really can take benefit um, from this te drone technology in multiple ways, from financial direct savings to time savings to human life and risk mitigation. And that obviously it's very difficult to put a price tag on. Now let's take a look at hazardous materials. Um, those incidents are always multi-hour incidents. And oftentimes we have to go into these hot zones, into these areas where there may be a gas leak or there may be a, a trail cart that has a, a, a leak and we need to do some manual work. But these individuals oftentimes are going into the unknown. Utilizing any sort of autonomous technology from drones or ground robotics can allow us to get information or even bring tools to these teams in a much faster way. And if we can save even just one trip um, into this hot zone, we're already saving money because um, first of all, those suits are not only very expensive, but they're most of the times only used for one incident. Secondly, after 30 minute stay in one of these uh, hazardous uh, material uh, suits, um, people are spent and need time to recover, hydrate, and they can't just go back and do another round uh, to the hot zone. So even one flight that gives us additional information and allows us to save one trip by foot into the hot zone can have a tremendous impact down the line um, of a hazardous material incident. Collision reconstruction. This one is really one where my best friend Mark and I 10 years ago started to use drones because we were really able to map an accident scene and then 
figure out the sequence of events. And if we have an accident scene on a highway and there may be fatalities involved, and now we need to um, reconstruct all of this, there is a potential that the entire highway may have to be shut down for the ground crews to come in and do imagery to do potential LIDAR scanning when we could utilize and are utilizing drone technology to map the area from the air, um, allowing for the traffic to flow, uh, even if it's only on one lane. Also the risk reduction, because now we don't need to have individuals on the close portion of the freeway. Um, we, we don't need to have more people guiding traffic because we can do all of this from the air in a fast, quick way that allows for the freeway to be opened much sooner while we then process the data um, after the, the actual capture event. So here, um, that's one area where especially highway uh, safety departments are utilizing drones very, very rapidly in the United States to to speed up the process of opening up the freeway. Obviously drones can not only be flown outside, but they can also assist us indoors. And the use of robotics indoors is not a new concept. For decades, public safety has used ground robotics to go uh, potentially check out a piece of luggage that is left behind in a gate area at an airport or to go inside a structure to give us eyes on the inside. However, most of these robotic units are very large and cumbersome. And oftentimes when we have to go into a scene um, where we have an indoor environment, it's not like these people were very tidy and leave enough space for these robots to roam around the ground. Oftentimes these ground robots get stuck. And so, uh, we need something to maneuver in 3D space. And drones have really become the go-to platform for SWAT teams to go into a building, to get eyes on the scenes, to even just land the drones in different areas, looking down the hallway, looking for any sort of movements before they decide the next steps. So a fantastic use case. At the same time, we're also using drones on the outside. So if we are about to enter a home during a swap mission, um, we, we can have drones already positioned up in the sky to see if there are runners. If on the backside of the house, they jump out of a window or out of the back door and try to run away. And so having that ability to, to spot runners is tremendously helpful. Now, the image on the right is a very interesting image because this individual that is crouching right now is actually hiding from the police helicopter that is flying at a higher altitude. And the helicopter in, in most instance, instances keeps going in circles around for safety reasons, but also to get the 360 uh, visual. And at some point, the helicopter is out of line of sight. And so that's when this individual decided to move. What he didn't know was that just a few meters above him was a drone that kept him in, in the center of the field the entire time. And so even though the helicopter didn't see this individual, the drone did. And ultimately, um, every, every move that he made to evade was met with the watchful eyes of the drone and he was taken into custody. Explosive ordnance disposals. This is another very, very fascinating uh, use where drones can come in and assist. And just like with SWAT, these We'll give Romeo a few seconds to come back in. These are you, think they? Hi, Romeo, can you hear us? Back in. Yes. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? All good, thanks, Romeo. Okay, sorry, we may have a little bit, we may have a little bit of a bad connection. 
Um, but I was saying in ordnance disposal, we also have big robotic ground units, and these are extremely capable, but also have limitations. So now we're using drones to augment the capabilities of those ground units and give a different perspective to the operator of the ground unit by either flying the drone above or maybe landing the drone next to it to give a side view, which is very helpful when the robot, robotic unit has to pick something up to get that um, depth of, of space view thanks to an additional camera that can be moved in 3D space. But we're also using drones, like in this instance, just from a couple months ago in the UK, to help before the detonation of a uh, explosive. In this case, World War II was low camera of X. That obviously created an immediate hazard to all of the individuals close by. So dr drones were used before the explosion, the controlled explosion happens. So to help evacuate, to ensure that no people are in the vicinity, drones were deployed around the area, both with visible light as well as thermal capabilities to spot anyone that unauthorizedly entered the area. Then obviously during the explosion, um, it was an amazing opportunity to see the impact of such an explosion to help with data sets that can later help other incidents um, where we have these large scale bombs potentially that are left over from, from previous wars to estimate what could the potential impact be. And post explosions, drones were used to look for damage. And that is such a fantastic use case here where we can see the drone being used pre, during, and post incident. I mentioned before the concept of the drone as a first responder. And one of the leading police south of San Diego, California, very close to the border to Mexico. And they were part of an FAA program to really get a better understanding how this concept of launching a drone from the roof of a police station to the incident site would work and were there real benefits. To date, they have deployed almost 6,000 times and over um, half of the time the drone arrives on the scene before any other ground units. And that allows the drone to send back information about the scene and already give people an idea what to expect. But not only that, oftentimes by the time the drone arrived, the scene was cleared again or what was reported could not be located, which also allowed the department to reroute units to other locations. In this particular scenario, uh, there was a white car that was chasing a motorcycle and the drone was able to follow them into a parking lot where then the confrontation happened and units were able to be dispatched to the area. Um, so a really good use case. In my opinion, this is the future deployment methodology. We will continue to bring drones to the incident scene, but if we can take off from the roof of a station and fly to the incident location, that has tremendous value. What we're seeing now, and on the right, it's a very good example. The end of February this year, a drone was able in one flight to go to three different incidents. Now imagine that you're taking off from the police station, you're going to the first incident, you're already giving a visual overview, while at the, at the same time, another call comes in that's not too far away, the drone gets deployed from that location, the first location to the second location, and then a third call comes in and the drone still has enough battery power to go to the third location in one flight and gives, gives a situational overview. Now think about if we were to use a VTOL, a vertical takeoff and landing platform that has the potential to fly 90 minutes, two hours, 
how many 911 or or what, uh, what is it in Europe 114 um, calls could we do with one of these VTOLs? So I truly believe that that this type of deployment methodology on the fire side as well as on law enforcement has a big impact and future. Now let's look at some, some other instances. These are pictures that we will not forget uh, probably our entire lives. A little bit over uh, two years ago, this happened, the Notre Dame fire in Paris. And the story around all of this is, is extremely fascinating, but also the type of technologies that were used that day and night um, were groundbreaking. Yes, DJI drones did help track and stop the Notre Dame fire. And it's a really, really great story because having that aerial overview was such a tremendous benefit for incident command to make different and better decisions. And even though the um, police department, which was flying the drones, they didn't have thermal capabilities, even at nighttime, the visual light camera was powerful enough to give extremely helpful data points to the fire department. And this is one of my favorite pictures on the top left of two reasons. Number one, this white van. The police department had just finished putting together this van that had monitors on the inside as a drone command vehicle. And this was the first um, time where this was really used to bring footage um, straight to the incident site on a bigger screen. And the second reason why I like this one so much is that we have a female drone operator. And that is something we still don't see enough, not only in public safety, but in general in the drone industry. So this image to me was extremely powerful. After the fire, drones were continued to be used to help with damage assessments indoor. Sorry, Romeo, it's uh, cutting off again. Maybe if you turn off the video just for a little while, it may help. Or tell you, you side of phones, if that helps. Yes, <laughs> thank Am I back? Yes, you are. Yes. All right. So it's another perfect use case that drones don't just have to be deployed during an incident, but also post incident. So that leaves us to some of the disaster deployments. And I was part of multiple deployments in California, especially during the last three years with our uh, devastating wildfires. The first time we deployed was in Santa Rosa in, um, in 2017, October 2017. And the second time was the car fire in Redding. And in Reading, we had already implemented a lot of lessons learned. It was a huge wildfire. Um, it was the seventh most destructive wildfire at the time. Eight lives were lost. And here's what happened. We had, again, multiple agencies from fire as well as law enforcement that came together and that deployed the drones in very close proximity to each other. And so what we utilized was UAV detection and tra tracking capabilities, kind of like a, a, a mini control tower to see where all the drones are. And that was really helpful because we could do airspace mitigation, especially since we still had manned and crewed aircrafts flying overhead to the front line of the fire, dropping uh, water or um, cargo. And so, this controlled power environment that was also live streamed into the command joint operation center to give a common operating picture view was tremendously helpful. And what we learned on those first two wildfire deployments is that anytime we have a natural disaster, 
we are dealing with a very large area of destruction. We are dealing with a large amount of data that is most of the times on SD cards. We have very limited connectivity because the infrastructure is down. There are many manual steps in the data processing, again, because we are using storage devices that need to be offloaded. And obviously there's always time pressure because the better data, the more data we can have available as actionable data sooner than later has a big impact down the road. So one thing we looked into is, okay, what if we had an AI solution to help us with, let's say, detection of destruction? And so we built um, an AI model as a proof of concept to see if we were to fly over a neighborhood, could the drone get as much quicker destruction information than uh, previous methods, which are walking on foot with pen and paper and charting down an entire neighborhood. And here's what it looked like. So the idea was let's fly over an area and let's see if we can detect burnt vehicles, burnt homes and unburnt areas and then have a algorithm in the background that, that adds up all that information. That was really a proof of concept. And we were hoping not to have to use that, but then just a few months later, the big campfire happened in Paradise, California, which to date is still the most destructive in California with almost 19,000 structures that got destroyed. 85 lives were lost and it was just a tremendous amount of destruction across uh, an entire uh, county. In this particular incident, uh, we had 16 different entities that were responding with drones. And for the first time, we were st standardized in our approach and in our equipment. And that's not an easy feast to achieve because we're talking about law enforcement, fire departments coming together and standardizing. Um, one of the tasks we had was to create a high resolution map of the town of Paradise, which took us over 71,000 images and over 500 flights to map. Now you would say, but Romeo, why would you use a drone if you need so many flights? And my answer to you would be because we had nothing else available. There was still a lot of smoke in the air. So uh, crude aircrafts, the cameras that they had were not good enough uh, to penetrate through the smoke and get imagery that could be used to create these orthomosaic maps. And we don't have um, fixed wing drones just yet. So we had to use multi rotors. And that resulted in over 500 flights. And what that also means is your planning is pretty much a nightmare because now you have to plan all of those 500 flights so that you are covering everything and that you are still have enough of a uh, margin between those flights that no drone crashes into each other in midair by mistake. So it's a tremendous challenge. And we took uh, plenty of time to map out and, and chart those flights and make not only digital, but also physical maps um, so that the drone teams had a physical as well as an electronic map of the areas that they had to map. And every time, you have multiple flights, one of your biggest challenge is battery because those batteries need to be charged. And it's not just the battery of the drone, but it's also the battery of your remote controller and your smart device. And suddenly it becomes almost not scalable. If you have all these different devices that need to be powered up in the field, and it was a, a tremendous challenge to keep us going and that was pretty much the setup each team had. So each team had a Phantom 4 and a Mavic to do mapping and visualization. 
each team had a huge battery pack that was able to keep our radios and our tablets charged. And then we had runners that would come and pick up the batteries to one centralized location to charge them. And uh, ultimately there were times when we were down because we were waiting for a battery or we were waiting for an SD card because we were out of SD cards. So there were still lots of challenges. What we did was pretty, pretty incredible. So we created these uh, aerial 360 overviews where we created a lot of pictures that were put together. And now we had a 360 of, a, of an area. And those 360s became extremely helpful because A, they're fast to make and they're very high resolution. So it allows you to also zoom in and still get a lot of details. So we did, uh, I forgot how many, I think it was close to a hundred of these 360s. Then we did geo-referenced videos where we have the drone footage on one side and on the other side, the location of the drone. And that was really helpful because during a disaster, the landmarks are gone and everything looks very much the same. So now having that visualization of where is the drone, what is the flight path right next to the video footage was a huge help to anyone at the scene as well as around the scene. So that was extremely helpful. But then our main piece really was to create this orthomosaic map and do a before and after slider. And thanks to the integration into Esri and working with GIS um, uh, teams, we were able to, to accomplish this in, in, in a very, very uh, quick turnaround time. So on the left, we have the satellite imagery. And on the right now, we have the maps that we created with the property And you can already see the satellite map and the drone data. In fact, the drone data became so helpful and so high definition that insurance companies also use these data sets to speed up homeowner claims um, and get them processed much, much quicker than uh, in previous incidents. So this data became helpful to a whole variety of different entities. And then we also ran that AI model that we had created um, on the previous wildfire. And this is the same community that we looked at just previously. And with one drone flight, we were able to quickly establish how many homes were burned, destroyed versus unburned or undestroyed. And even though this is within a margin of error of 5%, this is already much more useful than spending an entire day of two people walking this community and chatting it out on paper. So I hope this has given you somewhat of an overview of some of these um, use cases that we're seeing. There are many more use cases we could have looked at, but I picked those because those are some of the less common ones um, but the ones that have a big impact in the future. So let's see if I go back here, maybe now we have enough bandwidth so we could also answer some questions if there are any. Very, very, this was outstanding. Thank you very, very much for a phenomenal review. Um, really, really great stuff, Romeo. Um, we don't yet have any any questions, so I'll invite uh, our, our colleagues to to share any questions they might have um, via chat, and then I'll open it up in just a couple of minutes. Also, in terms of um, uh, video, and uh, Toby, I I see your hands up. Um, just to add, um, there's so much to 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 that resonates, obviously. Um, one thing that may be interesting uh, 
is uh, the head of our uh, of the Flying Labs in Cote d'Ivoire in Ivory Coast, West Africa. Recently, was in Chad for a good month working on demining operations using, I believe it was the M300 drone, um, and they've been really pushing the envelope in terms of doing helping to do mine detection um, in in Chad using using drones and. Uh, different types of imagery and, and I don't remember sensors and so on. I didn't get the full update just yet, but that's just to let everybody know that we uh, hope to have uh, Abu Bakar, who is the head of Cote d'Ivoire Flying Labs, who led this uh, project in Chad. Um, he's, he's very kindly agreed to do a webinar um, for, for us, for, the, for Flying Labs, as well as the, all participants of this course. So <clears throat> hopefully that'll happen in May or June, just for all of you to know. Um, with that, um, Toby, you had a question, so feel free to take the mic. <clears throat> Romeo, thanks very much. That was a uh, fantastic talk and very insightful. Um, I've, I've been, um, I was wondering, when you mentioned about the use of uh, fire management, uh, it seems it's being used very extensively over in the US for public safety. Do you have any thoughts about its application within the humanitarian sector, say for in IDP or refugee camps? I'm thinking in particular like the recent fire in Rohingya. Um, do you see kind of applications there? Uh, can't quite hear you right now, Romeo. Again. Ah, you're back. All right. Um, Patrick can probably speak to this much more than, than, than I, but there is any time when we deploy drones in the humanitarian environment, especially when we talk about refugee camp, there's also a lot of ethical questions that, that we need to address and, and think about. Um, I, I do remember there were a few years ago, there was a, a, a project with one of the uh, UN entities were we were scheduled to go to to a refugee camp and help map out the camp and after extensive discussions ahead of the program we decided not to do it because there were still so many ethical questions that had not been addressed when it comes to refugee camps and using technologies um, and i think it was the right call at the time a lot of progress has been made since, especially thanks to, to We Robotics and the engagement that has come out of there. Obviously, there, there could be tremendous benefits in, in utilizing aerial technology to, to map out camps, to map out um, areas for, for pre-incident preparations. Um, I don't know, Patrick, do you have anything that, that, that you can give a little bit more insight to? I think it's a great question. I think a great answer. I don't. I don't know that I have much more to add. I've not worked um, uh, with with fire incidents, so it, I I would just see it very applicable because at the end of the day, you're getting situational awareness from a fire incident, whether that's in the U.S. with the wildfires there or in the in the context of a of a, a refugee camp. I think the the main differences potentially uh, or not potentially are are just on the the community engagement side of things, because obviously having a fire go off in a in a in a refugee camp brings other um, you know you're already you're already talking about a a, a a community that's at risk and 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 vulnerable and has already uh, possibly experienced um, some levels of of trauma and so that's that's that that human element there, which is not to say you know. Uh, folks in the U.S. weren't traumatized. I mean, we we know they were absolutely. They're not as vulnerable a group as refugees in Bangladesh. So I think there is that that element of it. But I don't know from the operations tactics and so on uh, how much else would be different from the, uh, on the technical side. Um, but if anybody else has uh, anything to um, uh, to add or as a on this particular topic, uh, Toby, if you want to follow up with anything, or anybody else want to talk about this particular topic, otherwise, feel free to follow up with um, with other questions. The one thing that I would like to add is, you know, the the, the idea we had was to to pre map the camp and then do every two or three months a follow up to 
to not only see how does the camp change over time, but to always have a digital map for ingress and egress points because of the, the constant change of, of these camps. And that alone could be a tremendously helpful tool. Um, but again, we, we, didn't, we didn't do it. And uh, I think at, at some point, really, that this has to be established. I know there are now multiple entities that are working um, with refugee camps. And I, I'm positive that, that, that this will happen much sooner than later. Yeah, we did. The, 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 yeah. I, the IOM have, uh, the International Office of Migration have a, a fairly substantial drone unit for, for doing exactly that, creating the maps. So I think it originated in Haiti uh, in 2010 um, and displacement tracking matrix. It just seems to be, I think this, sorry, this leads on to my kind of next question to, to you, Patrick, Romeo, and everyone in the group who's experienced in the humanitarian sector. Um, whether the, the fact that drones are being more normalized is changing the perception within the UN that they shouldn't be deployed in conflict settings. Is, is that something that's going on, do you think, um, within the drone community and wider humanitarian community? That's a great question. Not, uh, not, not, uh, not that I, I know of. I, I, there are the examples I've come across in terms of uh, formal applications of drones in conflict zones by international organizations are um, very hush hush. Um, they're not talked about publicly at all, I think, for, for obvious reasons. Um, whether the appetite has changed, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I, I only have a anecdotal uh, evidence and that uh, doesn't mean it's a pattern. Um, but I, I haven't seen more widespread use in 2020, let's say, of drones and conflict zones than I have in 2016. Um, that could also be because maybe it's even more hush-hush now. Um, or it's simply they're not as happening as much. But um... there, there's a, there's two sides of this. Yes, um, you know, the defense units uh, love the idea of quick deploy platforms that can give them, uh, you know, information that they otherwise would not have had. But the same is also true now, looking from the other side, um, where we know that drones are also being used. Um, to, to inflict harm um, to other units or to, to civilians in, in, a, in a terrorist type of setup. And that brings additional challenges to the entire drone industry because we're not only now getting impacted by the public perception of the technology, but now we have to find technologies to counter this technology that initially was built for good. And, um, it is, it is a tremendous challenge. In public safety, it's also a challenge because we oftentimes have, you know, the looky lookers that are now using drones to create a cool YouTube video of this, you know, incident and are interfering with public safety operations, not knowing that um, their drone potentially is creating a hazardous environment because we may have also a helicopter that is about to land and pick up injured um, individuals and now because of that the, the helicopter gets delayed or in the in, in the instance of wildfires entire um, crude aviation uh, tasks are being stopped because there's one drone was spotted in the vicinity and that creates a tremendous uh, need for uh, proper detection of, of drones and remote ideas as, as, as we are going through in the United States right now is going to be one of the tools to help. And remote ID is nothing else than an electronic license plate that shows who is the operator and is the operator authorized to fly here. And that, um, I think, brings more transparency to everyone involved and maybe one of the steps needed to curb some of the unwanted uses of drones. Thank you very much. I, I have other questions, but I'm acutely aware that of time and other people. So thank you, Romeo. Thanks, Absolutely. thanks, Romeo. Any other questions, in particular, from our uh, colleagues in Eastern Europe with DPPI? 
there was one question I got via DM is, is uh, would you be willing to share your slides, uh, PDF of your slides? Is that an option? Oh, ab absolutely. Yes. Okay. Not, obviously, you wouldn't have uh, the embedded videos, but uh, yes, I'll definitely make a PDF out of it and I'll send it over to Patrick. And then we'll make sure that it gets out to everyone. That's very kind of you. Thank you, Romeo. Um, I'm also aware of time as well, but I do want to, any other, any final questions? Uh, hello. Yeah, hi, Mihail. Uh, uh, Hi, uh, if I can ask uh, a quick question uh, in terms of uh, safety. You also uh, introduce yourself maybe? Sorry, Mihail. Yes, uh, I'm Mikhail uh, from uh, uh, General Direction for Safety and Civil Protection in Bulgaria. Uh, I would like to ask in terms of uh, safety about uh, flying uh, in populated areas because uh, uh, Romeo mentioned uh, for first uh, responding, uh, for using drones uh, like first uh, responders in populated areas, uh, flying uh, from the rooftops of uh, uh, police departments to the uh, accidents. Uh, what is the evaluation of the risks of flying over populated areas? And uh, what are the plus, the, the cons of uh, such flying. Mihail, that's a very, very good question. And that's one that is debated probably across the globe right now. In the United States, the FAA, which is our federal aviation agency, um, just recently made a change in its regulatory environment that says there is one certain category of drone that you can use to fly over an open, um, open air assembly of people. And that category is very limited. So it has to be below a certain weight, so below 250 grams. And it has to ensure that the kinetic energy, if this drone comes down, um, doesn't injure anyone and doesn't and the propellers don't cut skin. So how do you mitigate that? Well, uh, a prop cage, a prop guard around the drone propellers can help with that, but prop guards add weight. So suddenly you may be over the 250 gram. Obviously um, that one category, I believe there is right now only one drone that can be flown according to that regulatory environment. Now, if we go higher up, if we have a larger uh, drone with, with slightly larger payload, we have more kinetic energy that comes falling down in case of, a, of an issue that then can potentially um, injure someone. So the question is, um, in, the, in the sense of public safety, when we have an incident, how big of a radius do we close off to ensure that there are no individuals in that vicinity, not because of the drone, but because of the incident itself? And then how big of a radius or how big of a distance do we have to fly the drone in order for us to get information that is very helpful? In most fire incidents, um, just being straight above the ground is already helpful enough Yes, potentially you would like to see the opposite side of the building. So you have A, B, C, and D sides of the building, and you would preferably see all four sides of the building so you can uh, do much better assessment. But that means that you have to fly a certain route and you may have to avoid the smoke. So you may have to do an even bigger route to get to one of those sites. And that could potentially lead you to fly over individuals on the ground. The risk assessment of that is challenging. Uh, there is no question about it. And certain departments in, in their uh, operating procedures have outlined how far of a travel way they can fly to transition to a different area and where should they be hovering. Um, certainly they don't wanna hover over a group of people that's just watching versus uh, hovering over your 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 own incident area. So if something happens, you know, it comes crashing down onto, you know, your fire truck or your incident command vehicle, worst case scenario. So 
there, there is no one good answer right now, except the current limitations that the FAA put up are, are great in a way that we're finally talking about it, but are because only one particular job particular meets that criteria and that cannot be the only solution. Thanks very much, Romeo. Um, Mihail, any, any follow-up questions or comments? No, thank you. That's that's good enough. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Just a time check, uh, Romeo. <laughs> let it. Let us know when you have to go, uh, because otherwise we keep you the whole day. I am here for all of you, and I saw that <laughs> there is a, a, another question from Toby, which is a good one about transparency. Um, monitoring police actions and operations with drones. Uh, yes. So. There is so much we can talk about this. And um, I'll give you a good example that comes out of the Mexican cartel. And the Mexican cartel or the cartels, they not only use drones to monitor each other, but they're also using drones to monitor border activity. And that is a big challenge, obviously, for border security. And similarly, we have had and have seen incidents where um, the bad guys were using drones to protect their little areas. So they would fly a drone over their estates and, and make sure that any, any sort of police activity, they would have advanced notice. Obviously, that means uh, you, you have to deploy drones 24-7, and that's in the current state almost not scalable. But we have seen that the the bad guys are also using technology to to have a, a you know a, a, st a step ahead of a, of the police for example remote id adds a little bit to that because if now a, a police drone also has to have remote id and i am now the bad guy and i'm just using my phone to look uh, are there any drones up in the air oh yeah there is a police drone okay so i know that they're watching me that can also not be the the, the answer. So there's a lot of still challenges that come with um, technology and then counter technology in essence. Very good um, question and equally very good um, answer to a really, a, a really important question that is also very dear to us as well across the, the Flying Labs Network. Um, all right, any other questions? I see uh, Yunus from Morocco Flying Labs. Um, any other colleagues from DPPI? All right then, um, thank you very, very much. So as um, Romeo kind of mentioned, we'll, we'll, we'll get a a copy of uh, his, his excellent slides, share that with all the course participants. The video uh, recording uh, will also be available to all the uh, participants of the online training. So you can go back to that and also, of course, uh, invite your other colleagues um, in civil protection and public safety to benefit from Romeo's uh, excellent presentation and all his expertise and experience. He's very, very kindly shared with us today. So. Um, Big, big thanks again, Romeo. Always such a pleasure. Clearly, this just reminds me that we need you to we need to have you far more often um, in these in these conversations. Uh, really, truly, uh, just the wealth of experience you, you've shared and and the way that you're sharing it um, uh, is is just superb. So, really, really appreciate. It. Big, big thanks to you and uh, thanks to all uh, our participants as well for for joining and engaging.